Hi, I'm Dr. Mila Brujic on the OI Show, and I'm joined today by Dr. Nate Lighthizer, where we're going to be talking about lasers, lumps, and bumps, and a whole lot more. Dr. Lighthizer, thank you for joining us. I appreciate you being here. Nate, um, before we get started into the discussion, I get... For, for anybody that's been practicing optometry under a rock over the last 10 years, give, give the audience a little bit of a background on yourself, uh, where you practice, what you do, and what you spend most of your time doing as well, too. Sure. Thanks, Mile. Uh, my pleasure to be here. Glad to, to have this discussion with you. Yeah, I've been practicing in Oklahoma. I'm an associate professor, uh, the associate dean and director of our continuing education at the NSU Oklahoma College of Optometry, like I said, in Tahlequah, Oklahoma. I'm a North Dakota boy, born and raised, did my optometry school in Pacific University out in Forest Grove, Oregon. I really got to Oklahoma. It's where I did my residency. One of my good my mentors and good friends, Dr. Blair Lonsberry, recommended, he said, Nate, you got to go down to Oklahoma. You love this surgical aspect, you know, the lasers, the advanced scope stuff. Back in 2009, there was only one state. It was Oklahoma at that point. So that's where I did my residency back in 2009, 2010. Uh, and have been a fortunate to be a faculty member ever since. It's interesting Nate, because when when we think about Oklahoma, like so, optometry outside of Oklahoma really looks at Oklahoma as being from a scope of practice, the leaders, the trailblazers, the 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 people that really emulate full scope optometry for obvious reasons. You have privileges to be able to do things that none of the other states or some of the other states can't do. Lasers injections and cutting um give us kind of a brief overview on how many states now have access for optometrists to be able to be um, licensed and certified for lasers for injections and for any type of cutting or incision yeah so it's certainly evolving and advancing back in 2009 2010 there was only one uh the first laser was actually done by an optometrist in oklahoma in 1988 so it's been 34 years now and through the 90s and 2000s, they were the only one. And when they're the only one, they're, they're the anomaly, right? They're the, they're, that's, that's the crazy Oklahoma. Who knows what they're doing there? Because there was no other states. But then in 2011, Kentucky uh, joined on. They were state number two. Louisiana was state number three. And there's currently nine states where optometrists are doing anterior segment laser procedures, such as capsulotomies, iridotomies, SLT, among others. So there's currently nine. So you can th see how there was only one for a couple of decades. And now in the last 10 years, there's another eight states that have joined. So we're kind of riding a wave now, just like we did for diagnostics back in the 70s and 80s and topical therapeutics in the 80s and 90s and orals as well. So we're riding a wave. So there's nine states to answer your question, Mele, where optometrists are doing laser procedures. There's even more states where they're doing injections. And injections are usually a means towards something else, meaning you're doing a biopsy, you're doing a, a lesion or a lump or bump removal, maybe a Kenalog injection for Shalazian. There's 12 to 14 states, 13 or 14 states now where they're doing injections uh, to treat a variety of things, principally uh, eyelid lesions, lumps and bumps and Shalazians. And then Nate, um, in those states where you can do injections, are they allowed to do cutting as well too? I'm assuming they have both the injections and the cutting ability or in the incision. That, that's correct. Yep, that's absolutely correct. Typically, it's the injection that's the limiting procedure. There are states that it would allow optometrists to remove a lump or a bump, but you just can't do that without the ability to inject anesthetic. So yes, those states that have injections, almost all of them, there's one or two exceptions where they can only inject Kenalog. They can inject lidocaine. So they can do an injection of a steroid but they can inject the numbing medicine to then do the cutting, the lesion removal. But most of them have both. Nate, um, in the states that have laser privileges in particular, and this might be a tough question to answer, but do you have any kind of idea on one, how many optometrists percentage-wise in those states um, have the certification to actually perform laser uh, treatments? And then of those that have the certification, how many are actively utilizing lasers in their clinics or in their offices? Yeah, that's a good question. That's a tough question to answer. I don't know uh, the information for every state. I can answer for Oklahoma. It's 100% of optometrists that come into the state 
are, are licensed and certified to, to perform these procedures. You cannot get an Oklahoma optometry license without taking our advanced procedures course, which is our the surgical procedures and the laser procedures course. Same thing with Kentucky as well. When you go to Kentucky and you get your license, you got to sit through the course. So I know there are states like Oklahoma where it's 100% have the training and the certification. Now, what percent are actually doing that? I polled our, our, our Oklahoma optometrist about five, six years ago. It was one of our state association meetings. And I said, what percentage of you are doing laser procedures on a regular basis. I'll let you define what regular is. You know, is that at weekly, daily, monthly, whatever it is. And it was 22% of the optometrists uh, were doing laser procedures on a regular basis. Now, um, would I wish that number was higher? But it's not a de- it's not a small percentage of 22%. And when I lecture in person, Mile, I always ask docs, say, what percentage of you guys do low vision? And it's like almost no hands go up. There's always two or three or four. All of you could do low vision, but not all of you choose to do low vision. What percentage of you do vision therapy? All of you could, but there's only a small percentage uh, that would. How many of you would treat a central corneal ulcer? All of you could. So just because there's only you know one out of five or one out of four that do it, it doesn't mean that optometry shouldn't move forward and, and pursue this arena of advanced privileges. So those are the answers based on Oklahoma. I think that's a great perspective, Nate, because I think this is really emulating the fact that optometry as a whole, we're becoming much more specialized in the care that we're providing. Again, I know my limits with certain conditions. Vision therapy is a perfect one, Nate. Um, I, I see the need for it. I understand it. I think I'm pretty good at identifying those children that would benefit from it. But when it comes to the actual treatment and, and going through that vision therapy process, I know that I'm not in that patient's best interest to get them where they need to be. And I know where those local resources are to get them the vision therapy needs that they require to actually get function better. And I think lasers are following that same same thought process. And I just I, I think it is emulating this increased specialization in 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 the procedures that we're we're doing in our practices, not only physical procedures, but multi lenses, vision therapy, low vision, all of this. I mean, is that kind of a fair statement, Nate? It's a very fair statement. I always make the the point when I'm lecturing, you know, I love to do these procedures. Laser, I've been responsible for over thousands of procedures. Um, I am no more of an optometrist than any other optometrist out there. My wife is an OD, practices here in Oklahoma. She's taken all the training that Oklahoma requires. And in 13 years, she's never done a procedure. It's not her interest. She she loves to fit scleral lenses and do all that kind of stuff. I'm no more of an optometrist that she than, that she is. She's no less of one than I am. We all have our different niches and specialties and what we love to do. And it's a win for optometry as we expand the services that we offer our patients. I do see, Nate. So we in Ohio, we don't have that expanded scope. We, we, we can't do lasers um, treatments. And I see the, the path, even just from a purely public health perspective and a cost on the system perspective. I mean, I see a patient, I identify them with a posterior capsule opacity. We need to schedule them with the ophthalmologist. They need to see them for the consult. They need to do the YAG and then they come back to our office. And that process can just be so streamlined if you're offering it in your offices already. I just, I see the increased level of patient care efficiency that can occur when you don't have to have that outside outside referral. Absolutely. Now, for people that are um, in your region or in your area, is that something that you commonly see at the school or the clinics that you're at? Are other optometrists referring um, to you or to other optometrists that are doing or have this ability to do to do YAGs? Are they referring for those procedures to colleagues? Yeah, yes. And it's, it's, it's really, it's a beautiful thing when you see it done like that. And it's probably because this has been the way it's, it is in Oklahoma for so long. Optometrists do the laser procedures here in Oklahoma. We've got a number of ODMD centers across the state. In Tulsa, there's four or five of them just in the Tulsa metro area alone. So when you have the dozens and dozens and dozens of private practice optometrists, maybe it's a one doc, maybe it's a two doc, and maybe they don't have a laser in their clinic, they will send to the ODMD uh, co-management center and the optometrists are doing the capsulotomies. The optometrists are doing the SLT. I've got a close friend uh, that works for a glaucoma specialist in Tulsa. 
And the glaucoma specialist has her do all the SLT procedures. I mean, it's just, it's a win-win as she's in the OR doing MIGs and other surgeries and the optometrist is taking care of the SLTs. Well, I really see that too as a, as a true need on the system because of um, technological advancements on the ophthalmological side, those, those surgical treatments that require an OR and where individuals require that specialized treatment, they're, they're just becoming pulled in that direction more so. And I even see ophthalmology becoming more special when it comes to the, some of the cataract surgeries that are done are unbelievable. The cornea physicians, what they're doing today compared to 10 years ago is night, is night and day. Yeah. And uh, that, that holds true with the glaucoma subspecialties as well. And the retina, I mean, they've been with the injections, they're just overburdened with everything. So again, there's places where we can fill a real patient uh, need and void in, in the yeah. Hey, what is a, I mean, so, so we refer for a YAG capsulotomy. What, what does that system in and of itself cost? Like, what does that cost an office to put in um, a laser for a capsule? Yeah, it, it's, it's not as expensive as you would think. A, a standalone YAG laser, which is what we do for our capsulotomies and our iridotomies. We do many more capsulotomies than ir iridotomies, obviously. A standalone laser runs between twenty dollars and $25,000 for that YAG laser. And I always make that point to docs. How many pieces of equipment do you have in your office that are twenty dollars to $25,000? And the answer is probably a lot of them. Um, a YAG SLT, which is as an optometrist in those nine states that we talked about, a combination YAG SLT is really ideal because you've got the YAG for capsulotomies and PIs, and you've got the SLT for SLTs. Those typically run between about forty and fifty thousand dollars, which still it isn't that eighty, a hundred, one hundred and fifty thousand dollar price point that you may imagine for a lot of lasers. So very reasonable. That's great. I can only make assumptions that that price will probably even continue to come down in the future, and it will probably be better equipped for those states that are going for increased scope and things like that as well. Too that'll make it just more more user. Um, the usability on them will even be better, which I'm assuming, Nate, they're probably pretty good now. Oh, they're, they're phenomenal now. There are some that you can attach right to a slit lamp. They, uh, we utilize ours as our anterior segment camera as well. You know, we've got a camera attached for our laser procedures, but you turn the laser off and now it's a slit lamp with a camera attached to it. So you can use it in a variety of ways. Great. Nate, I, I wanted to pick your brain on a few other things here. So um, talk about injections, talk about when 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 you're using that talk about incisions when when you're utilizing clinical practice because again i know that you're doing all of this on a daily basis yeah so for the surgical procedures or we call them the in-office based procedures it's it's catalog injections for chalazion incision and curatage for chalazion um lumps and bumps in the ocular adnexa you know basically in this area right there how often do you mele have patients that come in that have lumps and bumps on their eyelids, their eyelid margin, I bet it's on a daily basis or at least a weekly basis. You know, and it's our job as the optometrist, they come in going, I'd really like this removed or this removed. And we already are doing the evaluation. We're evaluating, okay, is this suspicious? Do I need to refer this to oculoplastics or ophthalmology? Or am I just going to watch this? We have so many happy patients where they go, boy, I'd like this lump or bump removed. And it's, it has no suspicious features. And we will use either a surgical scissors or a scalpel, or most often radio frequency, which is a an Elman unit or a Sonequence unit, to vaporize the lesion, and they they look great afterwards. So it really helps patients when we're doing these injections and these lesion removals. That's excellent. Hey Nate, I, I want to touch base with you on one other thing here before we we sign off. This has been awesome. But um, so how is your? Uh, I want to hear how your conversation goes for the glaucoma patient. Somebody that's either newly diagnosed or taking a medication or two, um, realizing that the ease of providing an SLT is, is there and relatively speaking from a, a diverse events perspective, it's, it's relatively speaking pretty low with the SLTs. How does your conversation look like with those patients and those individuals that again, require glaucoma care, you need to lower the pressure, but you, you have easy access to laser therapies for these individuals. Yeah, I'm, I'm a big fan of SLT, as I, as I think you know. You know, we have a lot of patients that struggle with eye drops. I'm sure you do as well. They're on one, they're on two, they're on three. You know, maybe they have trouble getting, getting them in. Maybe they're older patients, Parkinson's have, you know, they, they forget. the There's a lot of 
burdens that we face and hurdles that we face with these patients. And I talk to them going, okay, we need to keep your eye pressure in this range. It's kind of like high blood pressure. You know, this isn't going to blind you today or tomorrow, but we need to keep this in control over time. We have options. We can go to eye drops, which is what we've mainly done in the past, but we've got this laser now. And this laser is extremely safe. It actually uses your own body cells to clean up the drain in the eyeball. I always tell them, think of your eye like a sink. There's a faucet where the fluid is produced. There's a drain where that drains the fluid. This laser is going to work on the drain and it just puts a little bit of pressure in that area and your own body cells are going to clean up the drain. And patients seem to get that. And this should about keep you off another medication. If you're on one, we're going to stop from adding a second med. If you're on two meds, prevent you from adding a third med. Maybe a patient's real active. They don't want to be on meds and we'll go to that laser first. And if they ask me, hey doc, what would you do? And I've polled many optometrists and it's typically 85 to 90% of optometrists, experts in the field go, if it was my eye, I would choose SLT as first line therapy. And I tell them if it was my eye, I'd want an SLT because I don't have to want to put in drops every single day. So that's, that's the conversation that I have with them. The literature is really overwhelming at this point that SLT is a first line option for glaucoma. I would encourage the ODs out there to remember SLT earlier in the course of therapy, works better earlier in the course of therapy. And as more states uh, get uh, have the ability for optometrists to do this procedure, it really is a public health win because who treats glaucoma first line, Mele? Optometrists are a big part of that. Nate, um, how frequently or infrequently will you have to do repeat SLTs on an individual? So I just had a conversation two, two mornings ago with a patient that we did an SLT and they said, how long is it going to last? And I said, well, the sweet spot is somewhere between two and five years. Occasionally it may be less than two years, but somewhere between two and five years, we know it's not going to last forever. In some patients, it will last longer. I've had some six, seven, eight years, but the sweet spots two to five years, and then it's going to wane with time. But the good news is, is the literature is very clear that it's a repeatable laser. Well, Nate, listen, I thank you. Your wealth of knowledge on this topic. Really appreciate you joining us today. Um, and thank, thanks for being here. Thanks, Mele. My pleasure. And thank you all for joining us on this episode of the OI Show.